Welcome to Catechist Magazine. We can be found on the web at www.catechist.com. My name is Jason J. Rock Houston. We're speaking with uh, uh, Renaissance Rock Orchestra um, founder, composer, and keyboard player, um, Greg Fox. Um, now, Greg, a lot of people um, may or may not know who you are, but I I'll tell you, I reached out to you because um, I started seeing a lot of posts about um, this Renaissance Rock Orchestra project, and we're going <laughs> to uh, talk a lot about that. And I tell you, just yeah. based on the photos and the videos I was seeing up on Facebook, I'm like, Man, this looks like um, you know, like a great rock show that I would want to go see. And um, yes, and this is one of those bands that see for sure. This is one of those bands where I, I would kind of point to, even though you're relatively new, and say, you know, um, a lot of people out there. You, in fact, you and me were having this conversation the other day online, kind of chatting when I um, reached out to you about doing the interview, and I was saying, you know, um, I've heard a, a lot through my life that um, you know. Uh, keyboards suck and they don't belong in rock music and like I was kind of saying to you is you know you listen to any of those classic Deep Purple albums and what John Lord did and you tell me keyboards don't belong in rock music and this is further proof of that you know what you, you're doing now so talk, talk a little bit about Absolutely. the Renaissance Rock Orchestra and, and how this thing got launched <laughs> oh yeah yeah well thank you very much Jason it's nice to be here and uh, and hello to all your listeners out there from Renaissance Rock Orchestra uh, this is a a project that I've been working on for for actually many years now. Oh, wow. um, I'm a Seattle boy, yeah, yeah, and so I was kind of raised in the whole Seattle circuit and did the whole club scene there, and ended up playing with a lot of musicians in, in from the band Hearts and Queensrÿche. Did a lot of a lot of work with a lot of those cats, and and they've continued on to do a lot of work with me uh, on on numerous of our our songs for Renaissance Rock Orchestra. We have three releases out now with our, our brand new release, A Song of Hope 2020. And some of those guys from Seattle you'll hear on my records, Howard Lease from Heart, who was, wow. of course, also in Paul Rogers and, and a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee. And uh, also I have uh, Scott Rockenfield from Queensryche on, on our records too. So a lot of my Seattle roots you'll find here. But uh, yeah, I started, uh, you know, I was living in Phoenix. I left Seattle and I moved to Phoenix for several years and I kind of thought rock was dead. No, but huh. I ended up getting in a really fantastic cover band in Phoenix called Superhero. And we, it was just an amazing, amazing band. I did that for several years. Uh, but, you know, it just felt like there was really, uh, that rock was dead, nothing was going on. So I bought a sailboat and I sailed around the Bahamas for seven years. Wow, what a life. <laughs> and that really, yeah, it was an incredible bucket list thing, the kind of thing most people just dream of and never have a chance to do, but I did it. It was absolutely amazing. But I didn't have a keyboard on the boat, so I wasn't writing, I wasn't playing, but that experience of being out there just with Mother Nature and the ocean and the hurricanes and, and diving every day, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was just an amazing experience and it changed me. Now you know a lot of people you know um, get their start and you know playing in bands doing doing the cover thing and and that's really um, a great way to kind of you know hone your craft and you know people Absolutely. think you know you're playing other people's music but you know they're tunes that, that we've all heard and loved and um, you know especially if you're just kind of learning how to um, you know play your instrument or, or sing or whatever the case may be um, you know it, it's good to kind of practice what came before you uh, and then once you get to that point of Absolutely. you know it's time to do my own original thing Learn you know from the masters you yeah, know, yeah you're really learning from the masters when you do cover material. and in your case i'm sure like, like songwriters for, yeah in your case i'm sure like you were a heart fan of that and i mean to, to grow up like probably being a huge fan of you know heart and then getting to play with some of those guys i mean that That's had true. to be the ultimate dream come true for you Oh, yeah, yeah, it was a wonderful experience. I was in a band in, in Seattle with uh, the original guitar player and original drummer from Heart, wow. Roger Fisher and Mike DeRozier, who are both now in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, wow. of course. And that, and that band uh, it was primarily an original project. We were writing and recording a, a lot of originals. Yeah. And had two different amazing vocalists from Seattle, Scott Rosberg, uh, who was in a band called Striker way back in the day that had a, a top 10 hit that did very well. And then we brought in a, a gal by the name of Carla Maylander, that, uh, Carla Bowman originally, who just had an amazing, amazing voice. And, we, and it, it was a very, very exciting uh, band, great, great material. We did covers too, and really controlled the entire Seattle market in, in a lot of ways for, for a number of years. Uh, but it was a great experience working with people that talented that had so much experience in songwriting and recording and and of course i definitely honed my craft a lot working with those guys in heart so that was uh, a wonderful thing but 
back to the sailboat thing, you know, yeah, when I yeah. decided that uh, I just missed music too much and it was time to get off the sailboat, I actually uh, got off the sailboat and I moved to Venice Beach, California. Oh, wow. And I was living right on the Grand Canal. It was this multi-million dollar house. It was great great experience and literally within three months of being in uh i think it was even less than that within three months of living in venice beach i was asked to go on tour with florida oh wow wow so i was meeting people out in la and you know i never lived in la so i didn't have a lot of la connections but you know just from my experiences with the heart people and the Queen's right people up in Seattle, you know, people were sort of a little bit drawn to me and I was the new guy in town. So some great things happened. Now I never did go out on tour with foreigner at that point in time. They ended up bringing in a friend uh, who was able to walk in and use all the old foreigner patches for, from the old keyboard player, but I spent weeks and weeks programming that material and they actually told me, wow, this sounds absolutely amazing. It, it sounds better than the original tracks like the intro for uh, Waiting for a Girl Like You for instance which is a very complex sonic oh, yeah, um, yeah. keyboard sound and I'm that's one of the things that I really pride myself is you know I'm a Korg endorsed keyboardist and I've been working on Korg synthesizers since the 80s and so I have years and years of practice uh, in programming sounds and that's kind of my thing you know I try to make sure that my sounds are are state-of-the-art sounds that, that nobody else can accomplish, and I do that with my, my core keyboards and a lot of programming. It takes a lot of hours and hours, days and days sometimes. When I program that one sound for uh, Waiting for a Girl Like You, that took me three weeks to literally program that sound so that I was happy with it. When I go out here in Vegas, I have a, uh, a really awesome all-star Led Zeppelin band called the Moby Dicks that includes the drummer from White Snake and Foreigner. Now, right? Yeah, I want to talk about that because, you know, I've seen, um, I don't know if you were in the band at the time because it's it maybe about um, maybe five or six years ago when I saw the band and um, at some club in, in Hollywood, but I tell you, um, Brian Tishy, he, um, the drummer you're talking about, he's one of the most talented yeah. guys and he's the one that kind of, um, I think, put put it together for Nam one year yeah. and, and they've yes. been doing it ever since. And um, yeah. he has different guys. Yeah, we guys. also have a show called Bonzo Bash that Brian owns. Yeah, yeah. Which, is the founder of and it's so amazing i've done i've done bonzo bash many times not only at the nam show out in california and anaheim but also here at vamp in las vegas and it's so amazing because i get to play with all the best drummers in the world because we bring in all these great drummers yeah yeah here from corn it just goes on and on and on and and to play all these zeppelin songs you know because it's, it's obviously all about john bonham and, and bonzo material and what what an amazing experience that is but also we have another show that, that Brian put together called Randy Roach Remembered that we do out at the NAMM show in yeah, Anaheim yeah. and here in Las Vegas. And in that show, I get to play with some of the best guitar players in the world. You know, Bumblefoot from Guns N' Roses, yeah. Doug Aldrich, and it just goes on and on. And so see, doing, doing things like that has allowed me to have a really incredible pool of artists to draw from to do the Renaissance Rock Orchestra records. We have three records now. And our last record, we literally had 27 rock stars on it guys from everything from acdc to slash to to yes yeah, to guns yeah. and roses uh to robin mccauley from the from mccauley shanker group and wow. who still tours with michael shanker a lot so yeah, yeah it was a it's a really great way to to develop these relationships with artists and bring them into the renaissance rock orchestra which is basically a revolving door of well-known rock stars so that's kind of the whole concept of what renaissance rock orchestra is very much like um you know uh, white snake i mean coverdale's been pr probably the main uh mainstay in um and white snake all these years but he's got yeah. a great cast of uh, people that come in and out of the band over the years and um yeah and you can't go wrong, you know, Brian Tishy, I got to tell you, amazing, amazing drummer, amazing musicians. A lot of people know him as a drummer, but um, maybe very um, interested to know, talented singer, talented, um, plays he's a guitar. He's a guitar player, too. He loves to play guitar. He'd really love to be a guitar player Yeah. if he had his choice, but he's so well-known, and he's so far above everyone else as a drummer that he's kind of stuck being a drummer. I'll tell you, I think Brian's the best drummer. Yeah, and you know, uh, and he's, in my opinion, and yeah. I've played with many, many, many of the best drummers in the world including Mike, Michael DeRosa from Hearts and it's yeah, yeah. Rocket Field from Queensryche but yeah every time I'm on stage with them it, it, it just blows the crowd away it blows me away and I'm so happy to to have him in the Renaissance Rock Orchestra in our show and on all our records and, and you know um, if anybody knows anything about these events you're talking about you know Randy Rhodes remembered and, and um, 
you know, um, awesome Bonzo guys. Bash. You know, Brian is such a great drummer, but he could have um, probably made it, made the event around him and, you know, having these guest musicians come in, which he does, but, you know, sure. he does not have the kind of ego where, well, I'm going to just be the only drummer in the band, you know, playing all night. He brings in other right. talented drummers, and I think that's what makes those shows that much oh, absolutely. better because he's showcasing the talent. One drummer after another, after yeah, yeah. another, after another. Yeah, it's, 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 it's awesome. Really, really awesome shows. Yeah, and, you know, he's such a huge Bonham fan. I mean, he studies Bonham. Yeah so intimately you know he knows all the material so well in the history of all the songs every there's not one question you could ask brian about led zeppelin or about bottom that he couldn't answer and it includes everything about the kits that bottom played on uh, the sizes of the drums the way they were recorded uh the timings in the songs uh you know he's he's really a master of john bottom oh yeah i mean he i interviewed him about that he was telling me that um even get down to him watching like old video clips of bottom and like how he would perform on stage and how he'd hold the sticks yeah. and everything um yeah. down you know and another event they were having out here for several years i think um brian didn't have anything to do with it, but i think it was based on these events that he put together they started having after ronnie montrose um yeah, committed right. suicide they started having this ronnie montrose remembered and i tell you yeah. montrose started getting all this love even more i yeah. think than he got during his lifetime and people really started digging into some of the music and i, I think That's when they right. put together some of these events you know they're really special things you know very, very special, very fun. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Side note, my uh, my agent here in Las Vegas, Brian Towers from BT Entertainment, actually used to be uh, Ronnie's manager for several years. Oh, wow. So, yeah. And, kind of cool. and, and you know, Greg, um, I also want to talk a little bit get a little deep into your story because I was reading on um, your official w uh, webpage, um, gregfox.com, um, that you started playing the p piano at the young age of five now. Um, talk a little bit about that, because it's very young. Was, your parents kind of put you up to it. Was it something you kind of became interested Absolutely. in on your own? I, I come from a very, very musical family. Oh, wow. A very church-oriented family. I was raised in the church. Mom and Dad actually wanted me to become a minister, and I actually went to seminary. Uh, well, I went to Seattle Pacific University, and, of course, there, there was a, a lot of uh, biblical... Uh, roots for that and so yeah anyway i ended up going the, the rock star musician route because of my love for music but my mom was the organist in church my dad was the choir director in church my sister and i were singing when i was when i was five and she was three mm -hmm. this little light of mine we sang that in church somewhere i have a recording of that somewhere i'd love to use it on a record sometime but yeah so we had a piano in the house there was music all the time you know, uh, of course, as we grew older, that switched to ukuleles, then to two guitars. And violin, I understand, but yeah. The violin also, that's right, yeah. I, I just loved the sound of orchestras and symphonies uh, as I got, you know, as I started to grow up a little bit. And, and uh, you know, I, it, when you go into school, in, in elementary school, you have a choice of either going into band or going into yeah, orchestra. Yeah. And uh, I was fascinated with the sound of symphonies, and uh, yeah, when I heard the or heard the orchestras play, play, I just loved that sound, and and that permeates all my music to this day. You know, I have string tracks and live string wow. tracks on on every song that we do, and and my ultimate vision for the Renaissance Rock Orchestra is to have a full orchestra, whether we're on tour or whether we have a residency here in Las Vegas, that it will be a full orchestra doing symphonic renditions of, of epic rock hits, which is what we do now, yeah. along with our own material, a lot of Renaissance Rock Orchestra material too, and of course, you know, my goal is that ultimately at some point, you know, the classics will always be the classics and they're so important and people will always love them so much and and so to do a huge symphonic version of of whether it's cashmere or stairway to heaven or bohemian rhapsody whatever it might be that's that's something audiences are always going to love to hear and they're oh, going to yeah. be drawn to so since las vegas of course draws people from all over the world i want them to hear those classic rock hits to keep keep the history in, of, of rock alive by doing that but we will as things go on we will be doing more and more renaissance rock orchestra material and of course at this point we have three records to draw from but i have about three or four records that that are written not necessarily in the can but yeah. that are partially in the can so uh yeah there'll be a lot of renaissance rock yeah, orchestra yeah. records coming out to, in the next few years here's the question greg I, I mean you guys got three albums out wow I, I i can't i can't believe it and my next question is how how the hell have i not heard about this until now i mean um 
<laughs> I mean, well, you know, it's really hard to get traction with yeah. an unbranded, unknown act. How do you go about it? Yeah. We all know how difficult it is to, to gain millions of followers on YouTube or Instagram or whatever it is. So it, it's, it's very difficult anymore to get out there. And the same thing with Spotify. Yes, we're on Spotify. How many listeners do we have? Yeah. Not nearly enough. It, so please, yeah. please spread the word. But oh. uh, it's a very, very slow process and a lot of work. And of course, I'm trying to develop relationships with different types of record labels that I think will bring their existing audiences yeah. into, the, into well. the fold, so that we can meet just instantly. You know, have have uh, be on their websites and all their social media and, and gain millions of followers yeah. for the Renaissance Rock Orchestra. So that's that's definitely where we're going. Well, you know, Greg, um, I like to you know. Um, network people and that and make contacts um which is basically what we've done here and so um i hope that this is the last interview you do with me i, I like to keep in touch with folks and you know absolutely and, and because there's so much that we could talk about i don't think we get everything d done in um there's one no way i could talk for about eight hours if you talk to anybody that i've done an interview with yeah. or a podcast yeah. i could go on and on and on i've had such an interesting life and of course i have so much passion about the music that i write yeah yeah i bet and i think one i think one reason you're starting to kind of um, make some noise now with this is um the ob obviously is the, the las vegas show because i mean las vegas itself has been like it, uh, every place else has been shut down for the last year so yeah. las vegas is starting to come back people are starting to yes. go see shows again and then on top of that you're starting to have like name people like tony franklin and brian tishy and mark bowles and in, in this um and well they've always been in the band they've been on all the albums well tony has not been on an album yet but yeah. brian's been on every record but, but i mean like and people hear about this show oh i, oh, I, I want to go see that in las vegas oh mark <laughs> Bowles. you know he's played with Ingfei malstein he's played with you know and you know um robin mccauley or whoever we're talking about you know they bring yeah. their own little fan bases t to this as well absolutely absolutely and that was my whole plan when i originally developed the template for the show i originally developed the show when i first moved to las vegas i left venice beach because my buddy mikey bones mm. who was my best friend and my bass player for many many years and who helped kind of help me co-found this band in the beginning you know we did this uh together let's start a show called the renaissance rock orchestra of course i've always been the songwriter and the, the the main founder of it but but mikey of course was a huge part of the project mikey bones he passed away in uh 2017 so oh, i'm wearing wow. the torch for mikey as we continue forward and this thing does take over the world you know uh, as it becomes a, a huge force here in las vegas and and gets a residency uh, so yeah but yeah what a great way to develop a show at the show we had last week it was so exciting to talk to people that have been following renaissance rock orchestra for so many years that i didn't know were big fans and you know on facebook and instagram most people like and they comment etc but i was talking to people that were buying meet and greet packages and after after show packages from from New York City that came in just to see the show with all these amazing players and were you selling they cds and Texas. merchandise at the show What's that? Were you selling CDs and T-shirts and merchandise? Absolutely. Is that? Oh, great. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, it was so exciting to do that show. And, you know, the concept for Renaissance Rock Orchestra, as I mentioned before, is kind of a revol revolving door yeah. of amazing rock stars. Yeah, yeah. Well-known artists from every band. And, you know, like I said, uh, our last record, which is called In Times of Old, which you can hear on Spotify, that has nine different drummers on it. You know, it has has Vinny Apice on it from, wow. from Black Sabbath. It, it's got uh, Brent Fitz from Alice Cooper and Slash. It has Simon Wright from ACDC, Brian Tishy, of course. It has Alan White from Yes. Oh, wow. So, yeah, 27 rock stars on that record. And so that's the concept of what Renaissance Rock Orchestra is. So for the live show, as the thing goes forward we will always continue bringing in different artists uh whether it's robin sander or lou graham or That'll keep it fresh yeah guitar players like like bumblefoot from guns and roses we want to bring in uh, you know one of my uh partners in developing a lot of the show is michael james romeo from symphony x now i write all the songs but at some point i would love to do some co-writing with michael and i'm sure we will do that on some of our upcoming albums uh, michael's considered to be one of the top 10 guitar players uh, by burn magazine oh uh, top wow ten, top 10 metal guitar players in the world and of course what he's done with symphony x is just amazing oh yeah so, so yeah working with him uh would be wonderful and so i have this vision of having bumblefoot and Gun uh, michael james romey on stage together and guitar players of that quality wizards on the guitar of that quality this would be a show like 
had never has never been seen before. I don't think there's ever been a show that has had guitar players that are such virtuosos, and so I think it'll be a groundbreaking. So um, most of these guys that you've got involved in the show, like right now, um, are these guys that you know from work, you know, being a musician, working musician, or you just some some of them just people you reach out to, and yeah, sure, I want to get involved. Or uh, they've all been on, on the records. They, okay. Yeah, I, I brought them in on various records of our three records in the past, and they're all guys that I've done shows with here in Las Vegas, whether it's Bonzo Bash or the Rock Gods wow. Hall of Fame or Randy Roach Remembered. I've uh, done just so many things like that between uh, the NAMM show and, and, and doing the, uh, Moby Dick. the the Legends series show at NAMM to oh, wow. the David Harris production where I performed with uh, Nico and, and Alan White and uh, John Payne from Asia. Uh, I just went out and did a show with John, John Payne's Asia here without uh, down at Phoenix with Alice Cooper and Lou Graham where I got to actually perform and, and play I Want to Know What Love Is for Lou Graham. Oh, wow. And, and uh, it was like the first time it was pretty amazing. And to play those Asia songs was really quite a thrill as a keyboard player because they're, yeah. they're keyboard driven, not guitar driven. And to me, Alice Cooper, well, I had never, strangely enough, I had never met Alice before. It was really nice to hang out with him and his wife. Yeah, he's a such, super nice guy such and nice, such nice people. super yes. talented too. I mean, I mean, when you if you've seen an Alice Cooper show ever, I mean, it's one oh, of the God, great yeah. the, theatrical shows, and um, it, it's amazing that Alice can still do what he does. And, you know, he's almost seventy yeah. years old. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. know. I love it. It's, uh, he's still out there rocking. It's, yeah. uh, you know, and he has such a you know he kind of considers what he does to be a, a bit of a ministry down there to the community in Phoenix. So yeah. you have to really give him accolades. And you know, talk about Alice Cooper. I mean, a lot of people love his classic stuff, but he put out a great, fantastic uh, new studio album, like 15 new tracks this year called oh, Detroit I know. Stories. Yeah, great, isn't and it? and I tell you, um, for for a, a aging rocker like that to have a number one album of all new music, it's amazing. Love it. Yeah, love it. Yeah, it's fantastic. And, and you know, Greg, um, I want to go back to earlier. Um, talking a little more about your story like you're talking about so i was curious when you first start you're learning from five years old all these different instruments and like you said yeah. you came from a musical family now like a lot of uh piano players and did you learn like classical music first like um yeah learning absolutely and were you did you were you loving that right away or like like what was the point when you kind of started to get in into rock music or do you love it all i do love it all i do love it all um Rock is certainly my main influence, but mm. being a violinist, of course, I played so much classical music, and being a pianist, I played so much classical music. And I love the fact that in, in um, you know this um, Renaissance rock orchestra, I hear you have different music. Like you have, a, you do have a violin player too. You know, um, a absolutely, little... yeah, yeah. At our at our uh, first original showcase here in Las Vegas, I, I had a string quartet, which was nice. At this show, I decided to, to change things up a little bit and brought in just a really powerful solo violinist marlo zamartis uh, who is just a monster and she's just a, a real rocker and such a great performer but yeah you know so it was a, a little bit different twist on the renaissance rock orchestra vision but as it grow, you know i think as this thing grows it's going to continue to change i always want to have the solo violinist thing because we had mm. marlo do a couple solos here and there and i think that's a really awesome thing for somebody that is such a a, a great violinist but i also want to have the string quartet thing i want to grow that into kind of a chamber orchestra thing as the show grows and, and we have a, a bigger budget to work with and that's hard to say what's going to happen because i've had great success bringing in financiers for the show pre-covid i was in the middle of a multi-million dollar deal and i th thought we were going to take it right to one of the major casinos but covid killed that yeah yeah but now that we have this showcase under our belt and so many investors came out from from L.A. and from Las Vegas, uh, i got to thank uh, Joe Amato, the head of the Small Business Administration for Nevada, him and the Nomad Collective, an amazing event company that produces shows with Sammy Hagar and Pearl Jam. And oh, wow. they're also excited about this show. So I'm looking forward to the partnerships we're going to create yeah, with them yeah. and where we're going to go because they want to take it right to a major I mean, I, I dare anybody go on your Facebook page or, you know, your, your official site or your youtube page look at some of the videos i mean um it, it's really made a fan out of me like i said it looks like the ultimate rock show and awesome. see you could have it would have been a great rock show just to if it you it was just you guys going in there with this great all-star band and doing a yeah. lot of great classic you know um 
classic rock tunes that we all know and love. But I love the fact that you're doing that, but you're also putting in your own original music. That, that gives it really some legitimacy, Absolutely. you know? Yeah, you know, it was kind of, uh, I was trying to decide what to do with this show and what I wanted to be. Now, of course, part of the reason we want to do a residency here in Las Vegas is because it's the fastest way to build a brand. You have people from all Word the of mouth. I mean, I mean the show. yeah. And, you know, touring is so expensive. And for an unbranded, unknown band to go out and try to do shows and tours, it's virtually impossible. So you have to you have to build the brand and build the audience and the fan base yeah. for sure. And, and doing a residency here in Las Vegas is definitely the way to do that. And having three albums under our belt, we're a little bit different animal than anything else that there is here. Yeah. You know, the other cover shows that exist, other rock shows that, that are here. That It's all tribute shows and cover shows. I mean, and this is, I originally built this template around the Trans-Siberian Orchestra yeah. when I first moved to Las Vegas. Yeah. I went out and saw Trans-Siberian. I was going, wow, I love the show. I, I love classical metal. I know I could do this. Yeah. I could do this. This is what we should do. So that's that was my first plan. Now, because they go out and, and they, you know, make $90 million in three months during the Christmas season with the Christmas show. Yeah. I was thinking this was a genre, and it is a new genre that they kind of helped create. But I was thinking that investors would see that and go, wow, yeah, we need to get behind this and make it work. It's been a little tougher than I anticipated. So that's why at this point, of course, if you're going to have a show, you have to mix not only your own originals and that symphonic classical metal thing that yeah. I write into the show, but you have to give them these symphonic renditions of the monster epic classic rock, rock tunes. Songs. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that, yeah. So that uh, you can draw the crowd and draw an audience and, and have a sustainable show. Yeah, like I was having a discussion with some the other day about um, the band Queen, and I bring Queen up because um, a lot of a lot of your music kind of like big rock sounds reminds me of um, Queen, Thank you. Queen songs. And Thank I, you very I, much. Yeah, you'll definitely hear some of that Queen. Like sound I could hear you stuff. doing like We Are a Champion, Somebody to Love, like you said, Bohemian <laughs> Rhapsody. At this show, it was so awesome. At this show, we did a symphonic version. We started with the We Will Rock You, and we went into into what we are the champions yeah i can see that yeah yeah with with the strings and uh, some cool pizzicato stuff that yeah. marlo was doing and then we went right into uh bohemian rhapsody from from the head banging solo section out well and, and, and it was so powerful yeah people really dug that that's when they started to really cut loose and get crazy and see that's why a rock show like this works and i think too i bring up the band queen because as i was saying i was having a discussion about this the other day with somebody um like, like on the surface, you would never think you would be able to replace somebody like Freddie Mercury, and you really can't. Yeah. But I think yeah. part of the reason, um, you know, Brian May and Roger Taylor are allowed to still go out there, and I think the fans are pretty accepting. You know, first of all, they get Adam Lambert. He's kind of like Freddie yeah. Mercury. He knows his Freddie. place. He knows he's not. And yeah. and um, the other thing is, those Queen songs, like um, like maybe White Snake or Aerosmith, a couple of other bands. Yeah. I think I think it's you know there's. These songs are such a part of the soundtrack of our lives that, right. that we still want to hear these DNA. songs, you know. And um, it's not like Freddie Mercury's still alive and they kicked him out of the band. You know, he died and unfortunately he's no longer to be here. But those songs are so big to so many people that they want Absolutely. they want to continue to go to see them play. And, and, and they're be, important songs. Yeah. They're important songs. They've, they've created what rock music is. Yeah, and they are a piece of our DNA. They're, they're a part of our 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 soundtrack of our life, as you mentioned. So it's really fun to be able to play those and to represent those to people in a very, very powerful way with an amazing band with this symphonic, yeah. symphonic arrangements. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, really powerful. Like, like, um, you know, when I was announcing that I was going to um, interview you last week, Greg, I, I, I put up one of your song, your, your videos on my site to kind of give people well, a taste you. of what you guys are about. And it was for the video, um, Circus Life. I want to talk a little bit about that because... Life. I'm so glad you brought that up yeah. because, yes, if you're mentioning Queen, you have to mention that song. Circus that's why, Life. yeah. That's why. Life. Yeah, Circus Life. <laughs> I wrote that during COVID, and that whole new album, which is called A Song of Hope 2020, yeah. I'm releasing each one of the tracks is on tracks on Spotify and all of the digital platforms, kind of one at a time, kind of interspersing them here and, here and there. We have three tracks that are now released. The title track, A Song of Hope, I literally just launched here about 48 hours ago wow. i don't even think it's hit spotify yet but it'll be there soon but yes go listen to circus lights please everyone i mean it it, 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 it was like discovering um 
kiss for the first time. If you oh, know what I mean. Nice. Thank I mean, you so much. Wow, what a compliment. I mean, in a sense, it's very visual. It's it's like yeah. got that big rock sound. Um, if you look at the video visually, it's kind of like um, I want I describe it like kind of a psychotic like carnival. That's how it starts yeah. out. And right. and um, it's just very visual. So talk about the video because I mean, are these still shots that you kind of just you know put together or what is it? Because it's that's a, it. You know, at this point. I've been wearing all the hats in Renaissance Rock yeah. Orchestra, and it's been so, so difficult to not only be the keyboardist, but to be the songwriter, the composer, the arranger, the producer, the PR person, the social media guy, the content creator, the YouTube man, the agent, the manager, the, the wow. production manager, the stage manager, you know, all of that is what Greg Fox is to Renaissance Rock Orchestra, and it's just been such such a, uh, a difficult challenge to, to wear and, 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 so many hats so yeah you know i i produce these little videos at this point on my phone wow and, uh, <laughs> and so i take still shots and and i've got just point now that that i actually uh because again I, I urge people to go check out the videos i mean uh, very visual um very entertaining it's almost art like thank you um, so much thank and you i appreciate that i think people yeah. have a more of an appreciation for what you do when they check out some of the um videos and i do hope there will be um more great because it's just um it's eye candy thank you so so much boy i can't tell you how great that makes me feel because i always feel a little sheepish about it because i know we don't have great video production skills but well you know it's amazing the last yeah. the last two years of working on iMovie on my phone i've learned how to do a little bit of this and a little bit of that and now i'm starting to uh to purchase content from you know existing uh -huh. existing moving video content from other places but now that we're at this live live performance stage the, the whole idea is there's going to be a lot of live content from the ongoing show that we'll be creating videos with and that we'll actually start to to mix our live show content with uh, you know storyboard content we'll actually be using the band members yeah. and going into a sound stage and and creating storyline storyline videos uh, so that of course that's where we're going. and i think the more you go with this i mean the more you network with some of the players in the band and that are going to be appearing with you like you know we we're talking about bonzo bash and you know ronnie montrose remember and all these great events they have out here in la and yeah, randy um, anytime yep. randy rose remember and anytime they have any of those shows like um you know brian tishy for example um and even people that he has performing at those shows i mean they they also advertise the event on their on their websites on their pages. Yep, they sure. they post clips from it. I think yep. the more and more people start doing that and seeing you know this um, Renaissance Rock Orchestra, they're gonna want to go to the show. And I think that's what you need to start doing: posting more of the live um, yep. videos, you know, from the that's performance. The yeah, we had a crew there for this show, of course, and so we're in the middle of creating that content right now from the show. So a lot of that will be released on our our upcoming YouTube videos and we'll, we'll have it on Instagram. And were you having people like you typically do like at the show like you know filming it themselves like see those phones up in there? Yeah absolutely I've seen a little bit of that coming in here and there which is nice and, and it's, uh, I've been loving that too so really boy it's just seeing the, the energy and excitement of that crowd there was so phenomenal. It's not a gigantic room it only holds about 168 people wow. but boy that crowd was so responsive and so appreciative and so excited about seeing Renaissance Rock Orchestra, about seeing this show. People traveled from New York City, from yeah. Texas, from Connecticut. So many people from Phoenix and so many people from L.A. since it's so close to Vegas. People that I, I didn't even know were fans and followers, and I'm so appreciate, yeah, appreciative yeah. to all of them. I bet. And, you know, Greg, just talking to you, we're sitting here uh, doing the interview. Um, this just popped in my head. You know, you've been doing this so long, and, you know, um, probably when you first started, um, you know, performing live, you know, all these years ago, um, you know, in front of people, it went from like seeing seeing people like um, with their lighters to now, yeah, people you know hold their phones <laughs> up in there. I mean, <laughs> just true. technology. It's a whole new world. Yeah, it's a whole new world, and um, I mean, it, I still miss the lighters. Yeah, I mean, um, I still miss the lighters, but we burn the place down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm old school too in the way that um, people listening to this might not know what I'm talking about when I when I say. Um, I miss the days of going to a record store. Yes, folks, they used to have oh, these man, right. music stores where you could go and buy a CD, buy a cassette, yeah. buy vinyl. Vinyl's starting to make a comeback, but... Yeah, yes. Um, that's Yeah, you know, it's, it's so different when you actually hold that product yeah. in your hand and you're able to study the artwork and study the liner notes and learn about the band and the musicians in the band and about the songs. It just takes, takes this music into a whole other world yeah. 
we're, we're so interactive and that's that's what we grew up on yeah like i had some guy I tell me i had some guy have, i was having a discussion with he was tell me you know i got rid of all my vinyls all my cd every all my music is on my phone now i'm like oh, yeah. yeah okay that's cool oh, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's not so cool yeah yeah that's not so cool yeah it's too bad that you can't like uh Hold it in your hand. I, I hold it in your hand. I and, still and be personal with it. You know, have it be a part of, of your reality of, of, of like, your like, physical existence. Yeah. I I still um I still like you said I still collect CDs and stuff and that's why like I, I want to get I want to get all three of your CDs because just based on the videos and everything I'm like man Thank you. like I'm telling Thank you. you I think you I think you're really gonna enjoy it. yeah the, I'm I'm so proud of this this new record a song of hope 2020 and if anybody does want to get a copy since we actually don't have a record deal yet with physical distribution yeah. we did just sign a wonderful wonderful digital distribution deal with curtain call records and uh, very very excited about that thank you John and uh, thank you GG over there at curtain call records really excited about what's going to happen with that and where they could go uh, the great thing about uh, curtain call records is uh, there, our first single, In My Love and Arms, uh, will probably be released within the next week here. And uh, that will hit 20 million listeners a week. Wow, wow. All around the world. So that should be a, a pretty good little push. There could be a lot of people going to the YouTube, uh, to the social media. It should start really growing in leaps and bounds. I can't wait for it to go viral. Yeah, and I, you know, and I think you're very smart. It start taking yeah. care of itself. I think you're very smart launching this in Vegas because it, it's interesting. Like you said, you, you've lived all over the world. And... Um, I mean, like, at one point, Seattle was, like, kind of um, where everything was happening in the early 90s. You know, grunge was big. I mean, for you, what was that like all of a sudden? Um, that was horrible for me. That was the time that I left Seattle. Wow. I had been I had been in, you know, cover bands and, and working bands for years and years in Seattle. And, and original bands, too many original bands, yeah. including, uh, yeah, you yeah. Know, uh, the band with Roger Fisher and Mike DeRozier, which was called Ten Bowls, but uh, yeah, it did a lot of did a lot of recording at uh, Bad Animals Recording Studio, oh, wow. Mark People, and before that, it was it was uh, K Smith Studios, London Bridges, all these studios did a lot of work there. But at that point in Seattle, everything was grunge, yeah, and, and it, there was no keyboards. There was no work for me as a keyboard player yeah. anymore. Queensrÿche was also going through the same kind of a thing where uh, they're. But the, their popularity was starting to wane yeah. in the mid '90s, and there was uh, there was just for me as a keyboard player nothing to go on. Yeah, so. you must be you must be amazed like at how Queensrÿche um, since that time has been able to kind of rebrand themselves, especially with the new lead singer and everything. They're more successful yeah, than ever. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, they've they've done very well, and and Michael Wilton's a very good friend. Well, they're, they're all friends. Yeah, yeah. Michael and I, I have seen each other. I, I had to take a couple trips up to Seattle to uh, take care of my aging parents. Oh, wow. And, uh, on those trips, I was able to uh, hang out with Michael a couple times. Yeah. had a great time. And, and uh, they're out doing a lot of great things now. And uh, that's why you know, that guy, Alex yeah. Raphael, who used yeah. to run sound for for Metallica, Queens, oh, wow. Def Leppard. He's been he's he's the guy that mixes our sound. And boy, the sound was incredible at this show, and it, and it always will be. Yeah, I bet. And, and you know, and the, you you make a couple of good points there uh, talking about grunge music because I like some of it, like Alice in Chains, but I, I was not a huge fan. See, see, Alice in Chains kind of has a metal kind of element to what they do, but a lot of those bands I did not like for obvious reasons, like. I was thinking a lot of times, um, well, you know, I miss all that kind of fun time music I grew up on. I don't want to. I don't want to be depressed. You know, I don't want to be right. brought down. I, yes. I, when I go to a show, I want to be entertained. I want to kind of be brought up. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's what I try to do in the songs I write, definitely. And as a keyboard player, you know, it, it, it facilitates my ability to, yeah. to bring in a lot of different influences. Uh, oh yeah. Whether whether it's the whole prog I mean, influence from my background with Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, and yes, in Kansas, you're going to hear a lot of Kansas in my yeah. stuff. You're going to hear a lot of Queen. Every now and then, you hear a little bit of Elton John kind of style. Yeah, I was, I was going to get ready to bring that up because I, I was looking on your page again and saying you, you were influenced by all these great like um, you know piano players, like everything from you know Led Zeppelin, the Beatles, Elton John. Deep Purple, we were talking about Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, you know, and then of course Rick Wakeman. He's he doesn't get a, a big mention often, but he's like one of the ultimate sure. keyboard. Absolutely, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, people. I would say he probably the way I play is closer to Rick Wakeman than, than anyone else. I'm a huge, huge Yes fan. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's my go-to music. That's my favorite. I still listen to it almost every day. Kansas is very, very popular to yeah. me. Still, to yeah. uh, seems timeless to me. 
Oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so the, Rick Wakeman, yeah, I'm glad you brought him. And, and Rick Wakeman, I bring him up, too, because um, as, as much as people know him from Yes, um, pe- um, are you aware of it? He played on some of those um, classic Black Sabbath albums. Oh, gosh, he's played on so many things. I mean, yeah. with David Bowie. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just It goes on and on, and the, the, the early stuff. And he still put out great on. solo music, you know? Um, yeah. And so you got to give him credit for, for still doing what he does. And um, the other thing I was going to say, Greg, is... Um, T- bringing up the Seattle scene and when grunge was big, um, how did you feel of it? Because for, for, I know most of the years when I was growing up, um, the, kind of a ca- music capital was either L.A. or New York, and neither of those, right. neither of those places are what they once were. And um, right now, it's, it's either Vegas or even, even Nashville. A lot of the Asian rock stars are moving to Nashville or Vegas because sure. right. yep. the, both those places are known as Music City today. So I think yep. you couldn't pick a better place to, because even here in Los Angeles, the music absolutely. scene's not what it once was. Right, right, absolutely. I think Las Vegas is a great place for it to be because we have the ability to uh, to draw people from all over the world and to keep rock alive in a really great way. So I'm very proud to not only represent Las Vegas yeah. with a brand new project like the Renaissance Rock Orchestra that has such a huge vision of not only continuing to create t- uh, timeless classic rock quality music, you know, uh, like Circus Life that sounds yeah. like Queen, A Song of Hope that sounds like Kansas, yeah, and yeah. My Love and Arms that has a bit of a, a, a little bit of a Van Halen meets Dream Theater feel to it. So, yeah, uh, Las Vegas is a great place for it to be, and we will continue to grow this into a, a monster in the city. And there's another the song I came across of yours today. It's called To Be With You. Could you talk a little bit about that? To Be With You. Wow, that's... Uh, one of my favorite songs and a little bit of a painful song for me oh, to really? talk about. Um, one of my bands in Seattle had a uh, had two girl singers and it was a band named Savannah. Okay. And the band was uh, the band name was uh, came up was uh, was decided on by Monique Gianetta. Monique was the red haired singer in the band Savannah, and I was I joined that band and kind of helped give them some legs because I was a little bit of a known player up in Seattle at the time. Uh-huh. And uh, Monique and I always had a, a very special relationship. We had a relationship back in the eighties. Wow. And then as things uh, moved on in life, and I got married, and sailed, and got out of music for a while. A lot of things happened, but we. Uh, after I got off the sailboat and I was divorced from my wife, we uh, and I went to L.A. and did the whole L.A. thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of Facebook and social media kind of rekindled our connection again, Monique and I. Oh, wow. And uh, back in 2011, she was living in Tucson at the time. I had moved to Las Vegas and we rekindled the relationship. And uh, yeah, she was uh, in many ways uh, the love of my life. And, wow. And uh, just a brilliant, brilliant singer. She had such a beautiful voice, but she passed away of cancer in 2015. Well, you know, um, I, it's kind of interesting that I, I picked up on those two songs. I mean, um, this one song, To Be With You, they just talked about means so much to you. I mean, I could kind of just, in listening to that, I felt like this sounds like, this is like um, a page out of somebody's life. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly what it is. It's the story of our life together, creating music in Seattle, and uh, you know, touches base on on the grief and loss of her oh. passing. And uh, of course, writing music is always a cathartic experience. And that, that song was that to me. One of the neat things that I'm very grateful about with that whole experience and that song is I moved her up to Vegas, and I was starting to create Renaissance Rock Orchestra. And, yeah. And she was here to see the first record created and finished. And, and when I first started writing that song, Monique loved minor music, things that sounded sad. Yeah. And so I was writing this piece of uh, piano music for her. And I, I, it was originally an instrumental, and I named it Monique in Minor for oh, her. Wow, wow. And she absolutely loved the piece, and she heard it many, many times. And, and uh, and as the Renaissance Rock Orchestra grew, I knew that. And after her passing, I of course wanted to uh, write something that was a little bit more of a memorial for her with that song. So I wrote the lyrics to it and, and recorded the song, and I changed the name to uh, "To Be With You," which is the main the main line in the chorus. But thank you so much for for bringing up that song. And, Oh, it wow. reminds me, of course, of will always remind me of Monique. Monique, it's a, it's a story of, of our relationship and our life together. It's it's kind of anything. There's parts of that song yeah. that 
to me, when I wrote it, it felt a little super trampish. Wow, wow. I know, you know, Super Trap is really interesting because a lot of their songs are really up, yeah. really positive, but they have those moments of very introspective. Of course. Very introspective. And uh, I would say the same thing of Circus Life, that yeah. as, as up and queen as it is, it goes into those different sections like Bohemian Rhapsody does, where there's it's almost like three different songs in one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I hear you. you can, uh, to be with you what used to be called Bonique and Minor has a little bit of that feel to it too. Also. Yeah, yeah, and, and see, I mean, I, I I listen like typically to hard rock and metal, but I have an appreciation for stuff too, like Tom Petty and the Eagles, yeah. the Beatles. I'll tell oh, you yeah. why, because it's all great songwriting. It is and, all great. And yeah. um, those are really songs that, again, people wrote from you know a page of their life, so to speak. And That's right, and yeah. you can really, you know, it, it's it's quite different than than writing a. You know, a song like "I Want to Make Love in the Back of My Car," but you know, there's a place for that. Let's but do the horizontal bop. Yeah, you know, it's funny that we <laughs> have been talking here about uh, "To Be With You," yeah. which is on um, our last record in times of old, which you can hear on Spotify. Okay. And "Circus Life," which is on the new record, "A Song of Hope," 2020, the COVID release. Yeah. Yeah. Because "Circus Life" is also quite introspective and it's also a page out of my life i, I mean in the video uh -huh. you see pictures of me and my sister sitting at the piano yeah 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 <laughs> but it's, it's a very visual video and, and I, I think anybody's a rock fan is going to dig really any of your stuff and um you know you're mentioning about um you know the 90s when when grunge was really in seattle was kind of the yeah. big music scene now you weren't into that music obviously but what was it like for a guy from seattle all of a sudden People are wanting to move where you've lived all your life to Seattle, and it's becoming the new, you know, musical capital of the world. Well, it was it was kind of weird for yeah, me because yeah. it had been my life, and you know, I was one of the major players in that scene for so long. So it felt so odd to have such a uh, a genre that that was so non keyboard oriented, yeah, yeah, uh, take over the scene. So yeah, I, I felt very displaced very uh yeah everything i was doing and of course at the same time during that scene a lot of the big clubs in seattle like the aquarius uh, yeah. uh pier 70 a lot of the rooms that we've been doing a lot of cover shows in for years and and the national acts were playing and that scene was changing and, and starting to be replaced by djs you know everything yeah, yeah. the yeah. whole world was changing and so yeah i was very felt very alienated very displaced and it felt time for me to leave it was just like no point for me to be here anymore and yeah yeah i actually got into uh, the reason i actually left seattle was during that period of time i had started getting into the timber industry oh wow and uh, that's what drew me to phoenix arizona in the first place because i did a big land deal a ten thousand acre land deal with an with a vision to save the rainforest down in belize oh wow and so the idea was, uh, you know, the, the, the mahogany trees are, are being cut. And, and, of course, the people that are trying to survive down there are slashing and burning just, uh, you know, to try to grow crops to eat. You know, but the rainforest is going away. So the idea was to buy 10,000 acres of property and to log 300 trees and to build an ecotourism resort right on a river there. Yeah. So I went down to Belize. I actually stayed in a Mayan Indian chief's hut. They killed a chicken for us. We had a big feast. It was an amazing thing. I went out into the forest every day, seeing jaguar tracks and snakes, you know, with machetes. Oh wow! Looking at it, and it was so crazy. It was like it was like Raiders of the Lost Ark. I was out on my property, wandering through this rainforest, which is very difficult. It's hot. It's yeah, humid. yeah, yeah. It, it's hard to get through there. It's really easy for a for a Mayan Indian chief who is like four foot something. A little bit more difficult for six foot tall Greg, if you know what I'm saying. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you miss, do you miss, do you miss all that rain? I mean, you, you're trading like rain for humidity in Vegas. <laughs> that's, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But as I was going through the rainforest, we, we got, came to a Creek. We decided to follow the Creek for a while because it's just a lot easier to try to fight yeah. through the jungle. And as we were going up to the, up this Creek, we started to see rocks and stones that were obviously man-made and it turned into a wall and we found Mayan Indian ruins on our property that had never been seen before, not even by this man. Oh, wow. Indian chief. It's like, it was the most amazing, magical experience you could ever imagine. It was literally like right out of Raiders of the Lost Ark. I bet, I bet. And you know, uh, Greg, before I let you go, um, I want to ask you one, one final question about, um, I tell you, that guitar player you got um, that played with you the other night, Tony Elman, he, he's a great kind 
kind of great amazing. find. Yeah. He's my neoclassical virtuoso for sure. I have two of the, the most amazing guitar players because they both handle different uh, jobs, different tasks in, the, in this band with, with a lot of our material that has that neoclassical metal flavor. Who's the other guy you got? It's Christian Brady from Hell Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, wow, and wow. Christian is just such a monster, and so on the last record, uh, Christian recorded yeah. a couple different songs with us, which includes uh, A Song of Hope, the title track, yeah. so make sure you listen to Christian playing that, because he has this wonderful David Gilmer style, the, just yeah. full of passion and bluesy yeah. melodic stuff. And uh, and Tony has the the brilliant uh, speed and and shredding. It. Well, they're both just so good in, in such different ways. Because I, I think yeah, Tony another, yeah. another song on a song of hope called the Universal Dance. That, oh wow, we'll uh, check those out. To, to hear Christian do his neoclassical thing on. Yeah, we'll check all that out because I, I seen Tony live a, a few years ago when he was playing in um, Juan Crozier's solo band, and he was playing yeah. all those great rat tunes that you know Warren yeah. Warren D. Martini made famous. <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, on Circus Life, we've talked about it a couple of times. Uh -huh. Circus Life is out on Spotify right now. You can hear it at all your digital platforms. But on Circus Life, uh, I wanted to have a very Brian Mayish guitar solo section. And so I wrote kind of a guitar mm -hmm. thing that had those harmonies. You know, the way Brian May used to record yeah. was single notes, right? He recorded yeah. every single note in a chord structure singly, and he would multi track that dozens and dozens of times. And that's what Tony did on Circus Life. So everybody go listen to uh, Tony Alleman's uh, brilliant guitar solo in Circus Life. This multi-tracked Brian May thing is beautiful. Yeah, we, we will do that. If you could hold on just for a minute, Greg. Um, Absolutely. 